there is a race underway. A contest aimed at total control of life and death. And with the human race as the prize, the quest for immortality and the dream of living forever is leaving the drawing board. And by using pure materialistic science as the vehicle, the time for implementation is near. Today's scientists are not only trying to understand life, but they are now trying to find ways of manipulating the most fundamental parts of human existence. Let's begin by taking a look at one of these characters dealing with so-called life extension. This is Aubrey de Grey. He is a biomedical gerontologist, one who studies aging. De Grey is also a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America. De Grey believes that machines or entities with beyond human intelligence will help to develop the necessary technology that will enable us to cure the disease of aging. I work on developing future technologies that can postpone and indeed defeat the biology of aging in humans and thereby save 100,000 lives a day. Yes, Aubrey is taking on the Grim Reaper. He is on a crusade against aging and like a real-life Gandalf the Grey is battling the forces of darkness. He has been referred to as a prophet in a number of articles, and with his long beard he comes across as the classic image of one. De Grey is also the man behind the Methuselah Foundation, and this is an interesting choice for name considering that Methuselah is the oldest living human that is mentioned by name in the Bible. He died at the ripe age of 969. Old Testament terminology and religious undertones is something that runs throughout the fields of genomics, bioengineering, cloning and DNA research. Now what you can see right away if you pay attention when you visit the Methuselah Foundation's website is the Golden Cup or the Holy Grail. The term Holy Grail is something you can often see mentioned in scientific reports and news stories. Prior to his work in cellular and molecular biology, Aubrey de Grey studied computer science. In 1985 he received a Bachelor's of Arts in Computer Science from the University of Cambridge and later joined Sinclair Research Limited as an AI software engineer. This connects us with the Knights Templar and the quest for the Holy Grail. The Sinclairs are a major Templar family. William Sinclair was the one who designed the Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. The story goes that many remaining Templars fled after the so-called Templar Purge in 1307 when the Grand Master Jack de Molay and other Templars were arrested, tortured and burned at the stake by King Philip IV of France. There are other references to the Templars as well, if we look at what has been going on with cloning. Just take Dolly the Sheep for example. 
the first mammal ever to be cloned. That we've been told about, at least. Dolly was cloned at the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh, Scotland back in 1997. Roslyn goes right back to the Templars again and Roslyn Chapel. Both the institute and the chapel is located in the village Roslyn in Scotland. Even the fact that a sheep was used is interesting in a religious context. Why not a lab rat or a white mouse? Well, that is because it's a symbolic reference here. A sheep or a domestic sheep is known as an Eve, and this is spelled E-W-E. -E. Breeders refer to male sheep as rams and female sheep as Eves. The Latin term is Ovis Aries. This is the constellation Aries. And this is the astrological sign Aries. Ovis Aries becomes Ovaries. Is this about replacing the feminine? Is this about changing the natural process of reproduction and replacing it with cloning? this go back to Eve and what really happened in the Garden of Eden? Or is this simply about cloning sheeple? is the project name for a self-described human cloning company founded the same year Dolly was cloned in 1997. And the dominating male symbolism is something that stands out on their website. Clonade is associated with the Raelian movement, which sees cloning as part of the path to immortality. December 27, 2002, Clonade's chief executive officer, Bridget Bosselier, claimed that a baby cloned named Eve was born. I'm very, very pleased to announce that the ba first baby cloned uh, is born. The media subsequently covered the lead claim and fostered serious criticism and ethical debate that lasted more than a year. And Florida attorney Bernard Siegel tried to appoint a different guardian for Eve and threatened to sue Clonaid. A terminology dispute over whether Clonaid is really a company or just a project name led to accusations that the whole Clonaid project was a sham. The Raelian movement was started by former race car journalist Claude Rael. In 1973 he was hiking in a volcano park in central France when he was approached by a four-foot-tall alien. Rael was told that the human race was created or cloned by this Elohim. He was also instructed to build an embassy in Jerusalem for the return of the gods and fellow prophets Jesus, Moses, Buddha and Muhammad, whose cloned selves were living on another planet waiting to return to Earth. So uh, Rael's story goes back to Israel and the building of an embassy or temple in Jerusalem. A new age religion in an old age religion context. So is all of this business with Ra'el and Clonade just a big hoax? Is it an attention grabber to keep the real cloning researchers and scientists out of the limelight and let the media focus on these bozos? 
It's hard to exaggerate the vigor of the controversy that surrounds human cloning. The world watches every move. The three scientists publicly committed to human cloning were summoned to attend the Senate hearings on reproductive technology. Antonori and Zavos flanked Brigitte Boisselier, a scientist working for a religious sect called the Raelians. Two years later, Boisselier would claim to have helped five cloned babies be born. No one has yet seen evidence, either of the children or of any scientific support for the claims. Um, we, need to go, we need to move on, Dr. Zavos, and, and you'll have a chance, in, uh, you have a chance to speak later. I, uh, we're, you will be given an opportunity. Now, I'd like to thank the speakers very much. The cloning for scientists session. were besieged by the media. The ARTs today, that's the Assisted Reproductive Technologies, if you're a woman under 35, you get approximately 30% success rate uh, in a live birth from that. You have no problem with 70% being born? Doctor, you have no problem with 70% of your children? You take, Doctor, abnormal. Doctor, you have no problem with 70% of these children being born abnormal? This is a disgrace, Doctor. 70% of these children, by your own words, would be born mutated and have to be destroyed. Children will turn out fine if it's done properly with he proper just screening. Said 70% failure. Please. What do you do with them? Huh? What? Obviously, they with? miscarry. They have to be terminated. No, you, you, you terminate. You can have a terribly deformed child. Nature generally solves the problem by carrying a miscarriage. How do you know they, they won't be born? Dolly's mutating. Is Clone just a sideshow to the circus of the Raelian movement? And it's the clone, I mean clown, Ryle, their good shepherd. Howdy, folks! Bozo in Sheep Thief Grief. Howdy, Uncle Cactus! Here I am, all ready to be a rootin' tootin' cowboy! Not so fast, Bozo. What I need is a good sheep herder. There's a hungry wolf been after my sheep, so keep your eyes open. <coughs> Don't worry, sheeps. Old Bozo will protect you from that mangy old wolf. Human beings are sometimes referred to as sheep or a herd as a definition for their unconscious behavior. Somewhat unaware sense of what really is going on in the world and their need for a good shepherd to lead them, constantly waiting for a messiah or a savior. And since humans are referred to as sheep, is Dolly the sheep a symbolic message that primarily is aimed at the subconscious, that the human being actually was cloned and not the sheep? So what is the message here? As the official story goes, Dolly was apparently named after Dolly Parton. This kind of leads us nowhere. Until you look at what, according to Dolly herself, was her favorite song. Coat of many colors on the album with the same name. The front cover of Dolly's album shows a split person. Split personality, or someone with two sides. This goes right back to the root, since clone comes from the Greek word for twin. This also very much reminds me of what William Henry points out in his book Cloak of the Illuminati, and has a clear connection to the MIT project called Mithril, a technologically advanced cloak or garment of invisibility, among many other things. Mithril is a uh project that is uh, being under in, in development right now at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, their media lab. And what they're doing is the same thing that Carnegie Mellon is doing. They're joining their computer science departments with their art and design departments because what they're charged with doing or what their focus is, is literally the design of a new human being and how to integrate circuitry into the human body. And the reason that the Mithril program is so just over the top to me is because if, if anyone watched, for example, or read the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you know that 
Tolkien uses the term Mithril, and this is probably where it came from. And in the in Tolkien's world, it, Mithril is the name of a silver metal substance. It was light and hard and did not tarnish, and it, it created body armor for the figures. And this is exactly what the Mithril program is designed to do at MIT. And they're so over the top in their symbology that when you visit their website, and it's spelled M-I-T-H-R-I-L, when, when you visit their, their website, what you find is that their logo is a simple cloak that is plain on the outside, but multicolored on the inside. That rings of the, the cloak of many colors of the biblical tale of Joseph. But the interesting thing to me about that was, was the, the concept that's communicated by their logo. They're saying, we're going to look plain on the outside, but all the good stuff is going to go on the inside. Once again, demonstrating that the step is to go from wearable computing, artificial hearts, pacemakers, eyeglasses, MP3 players, all of that sort of thing. Into putting this technology underneath the skin. So we look plain on the outside, just like an ordinary human, but on the inside, we're wired. We're talking about interweaving computer technology with our DNA. We're talking about human beings as batteries, as cells that are walking around the planet that are all interconnected in what they literally describe in this government report on these converging technologies as a hive mind. In fact, in this report, they recommend to the U.S. government that we begin to spend tens of millions of dollars getting Americans used to the idea that we're all part of a hive mind. This clone, Split, or the Twin, is an image that comes up again when we look at a key player behind the sequencing of the human DNA. This is Craig J. Venter in a very interesting photo, looking very much like a guy with a coat of many colors, a twin or a split cloak. Craig J. Venter has also been called Darth Venter. He got this nickname because of his bully character when it comes to his work with the Human Genome Project. He has publicly declared, I am the Human Genome. And he was literally right because very recently it was announced that it was his DNA that the Human Genome Project worked on. So the first DNA ever to be completely sequenced belonged to Craig J. Venter. Looking at this photo again of Craig, it reveals quite a lot. For instance, it references the nickname Darth Venter or Darth Vader, someone who has turned to the dark side. The black and the white are very important. White is attributed to doctors, the men in white. They are the ones who care for your life. Well, at least that was the idea. And the men in black, the lawmen, the priests, and even the Grim Reaper or Saturn is dressed in black for judgment and death. Craig in this photo is wearing the white doctor's robe on his right side and the black business, commerce or corporate suit on his left side. There's two ways we can go from here. Black and white has everything to do with the game of chess. Black and white is also the colors associated with the Knights Templar that used a black and a white flag. As stated, white is life and black is death. What is interesting is that the one who can move between these worlds is known as the Grey Man. Is there an extraterrestrial connection here? We are going to return to talk more about the Greys a little bit later. Recently the X-Prize Foundation for Genomics announced a 10 million dollar reward to the first company that can sequence the DNA of 100 people in less than 10 days. I would suggest 
that one reason for this speed sequencing has to do with the fact that a global DNA database is in the works, and there is a proposal in the UK that police should be able to take samples of your DNA without even having to suspect that you've committed a crime. The X Prize dubbed this contest the Archon X Prize for genomics. Archon is a Greek word that means ruler, referring to the elites of ancient Greece. But we have reason to believe that this word has older roots than this, and originally comes from Gnostic texts like the Nag Hammadi library that talks about beings or entities moving between layers of creation, shadowy figures that were present in the Garden of Eden during the creation of Adam and Eve. Some researchers believe that the Archons are extraterrestrials that were responsible for the intervention theory, meaning that our ancestors' DNA was tampered with and uh, this gave rise to the human race as it is today. Let's go back and talk about Aubrey de Grey. It has been very difficult to establish Aubrey's family connections. De Grey is not a very common name and since we are making connections to the Templars, we must mention that there is a place called the Honorable Society of Grey's Inn. This is one of the four inns of court around the Royal Courts of Justice in London, England, to which barristers belong and where they are called to the bar. It's called Grey's Inn because at one time the manor was the property of Reginald de Grey, the first Baron Grey de Vilton, and he was the Chief Justice of Chester, Constable and Sheriff of Nottingham, who died back in 1308. On a side note, in the South Square, on one of the courtyards of Grey's Inn, stands a famous statue of Francis Bacon. Bacon is said to have played a major part in setting up the scientific field as we know it today. What we want to lay forth here is an idea that there is an overarching theme in all of this to the grey man. Let's elaborate on this. Take a look at this checkerboard for instance, or even the Freemasonic tracing board. Life is symbolized by white and death is symbolized by black. The grey man is the one who moves between these worlds of white and black. A mix between the two makes the grey. So isn't it interesting that de Grey, an old family with connections to Temple Bar and probably the Templars, now have a guy called de Grey working on this new frontier of science, a quest for the Holy Grail, the search for eternal life. So, what really is the Holy Grail? The ability to make life? Some have attributed the woman and the womb to be the Holy Grail. And the blood is the wine that fills the cup or the new life. We could also look at it this way, that the bond between the female and the male, the life-creating process, is the Grail. That our genes lives on in this way. Another very interesting correlation to all of this about lifespan, longevity and intelligent artificial life forms is the movie Blade Runner. The central theme is about artificial life forms that are fighting for their survival because their designers have just given them a few years to live. Lean. This is Tyrell, the maker or the creator involved in a game of chess. 
knight takes queen. This is the replicant Roy Batty. The character J.F. Sebastian have what he refers to as Are Methuselah right? Syndrome. He's growing old very quickly. Which in a way is ironic but yet symbolic because Methuselah lived to be almost a thousand years. Bishop King Seven Checkmate, I think. It's not an easy thing to meet your maker. And what can he do for you? Tyrell, dressed in white. And the maker repair what he makes. Would you like to be modified? Stay here. And here comes Roy, the Nexus model, dressed in black. I had in mind something a little more radical. What? What seems to be the problem? Death. Death. Well, I'm afraid that's a little out of my jurisdiction. You... I want more life. Fucker. The facts of life. To make an alteration in the evolvement of an organic life system is fatal. Coding sequence cannot be revised once it's been established. Why not? Because by the second day of incubation, any cells that have undergone reversion mutations give rise to revertant colonies like rats leaving the sinking ship. Then the ship sinks. What about EMS recombination? Notice also that Roy has white hair and Tyrell has black hair. This creates a yin-yang kind of symbiosis between these two characters. You were made as well as we could make you. But not to last. The light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And you have burned so very, very brightly, Roy. Look at you. You're the prodigal son. You're quite a prize. Things. Revel in your time. Nothing the god of biomechanics wouldn't let you in heaven for. We will have reason to return to Ridley Scott's masterpiece Blade Runner in future episodes. Let's move from the fiction into the science and look at Aubrey de Grey's work on AI. Besides working with gerontology, de Grey is also an advisor to the Singularity Institute for artificial intelligence that in September 2007 held a conference in San Francisco to discuss transhumanism and the future of mankind and the birth of AI. One of the topics that were discussed at the summit was friendly AI. Researchers are trying to figure out how we can make sure that smarter than human intelligence, once it is born or created, isn't going to see humanity as a threat. The real big deal about a singularity is the negative side rather than the positive side. I like to work mainly on making this happen as soon as possible. But I spend a lot of my time on the social context, not just thinking about it but talking about it. And a large part of the reason I do that is because I want to forward plan. I want society to forward plan to cope with the turbulence that will result in society when we suddenly figure out that we don't need to die of aging anymore. This pandemonium will actually hit society, not when those technologies arrive, but much sooner when those technologies become widely anticipated. That could be only 10 years away. Okay. So I think it's really important to put time into this. Now, the Singularity Institute has a similar problem, focuses on a similar problem, namely the possibility that when we develop, if we develop these machines that are recursively self-improving and become extraordinarily intelligent very quickly indeed, they may not like us terribly much. They may decide that we are not very important. The Singularity Institute takes the view that we've got to get that first. If someone comes along and invents recursively self-improving systems that do not have this, what, what we like to call friendliness property, and that happens first, they will, they will you know, get rid of humanity rather quickly if we're unlucky. So we'd better, we'd better develop friendly AI before anyone else accidentally develops unfriendly AI. Now, whether friendly AI is even possible is unknown. Whether it's possible to invent machines which you can give the freedom to improve themselves without giving them the freedom to become unfriendly. We just don't know whether that's possible. 
but it's worth trying. Bless all forms of intelligence. Your flesh is a relic of your vessel. That's it.